Okay. Yeah, yeah. Evening, everyone. Yeah. It's not a comedy. Yeah. Um, but uh, hopefully we can laugh at it a little bit. Now. Um, okay. Yeah, so we don't have a Don't mind, that's good. I come armed with books okay. um, and badges. So, hi. Should we, we start? Yeah, we can just take the floor and then. Is that good there? Uh, or do you want me to be further? You just on? this one. Yeah, just please. turn it the facing. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, so just a bit of background. About 2005, we started thinking about um, economics because um, I was looking at the economic system, thinking this is going to um, crash really badly. My wife at the time was a banker, um, at, uh, and she was coming home and telling me stories about what was going on within banks and, and some of the recklessness. And frankly, some of the stories were unbelievable because of what people were doing. Um, and we concluded that the best thing that we could do, the most socially useful thing we could do, is, um, instead of just complaining about it, is make a film with the knowledge that we had at that time, which encapsulated the problems which we saw uh, were, were forthcoming. Uh, so we made the film. We couldn't find money for it, obviously, because the BBC, we went to the BBC. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, um, and in fact, my favourite uh, bit, because when we made the film and sent it round to get reviews and, and uh, quotes for, uh, for the uh, DVD box and, and all that stuff that you have to do, uh, the BBC replied, we sent it to them, and they, they, they come back with, this film has absolutely no place anywhere at the BBC. Uh, so we took that quote and put it on the back of the DVD <laughs> box. <laughs> uh, sales, why not? So, um, uh, so, so that's what happened. And then the other thing that was said when we were making the film, just the last bit of context, uh, is that you will never get people uh, 18 to 25 interested in economics. And, and the only people in the world who ever watch films are 18 to 25, apparently. Right? So I said, OK, fine. We don't think that that's the case. We think that uh, young people will be interested in this film because for the first time in human history, uh, younger generations aren't going to live as well as uh, the generations that have gone before them. And intuitively, they know that, uh, so they're going to want to know why. Um, and on the opening night, Tosinski One, which is the big cinema uh, and beautiful cinema in Amsterdam, if you go, uh, 1,500 seats, uh, totally sold out, and 85% of people, 18 to 25. So Larry Wilkinson's quote at the end there, that my optimism, my hope on my students is so far, with all our screenings, and we've done about 400 of them, uh, is totally in line with what he's saying. Because younger minds, and we've called uh, that generation uh, cohort C, it's not actually a generation, it's a cohort of people. Um, and if I've done a medium blog uh, called Introducing Cohort C. If you Google it, it'll, it'll tell you a little more about what I'm banging on about. Um, the, but it's a multi-generational mindset, actually, and it's a mindset of people who want to do the right thing and not get holed up in, in, in jobs where they're forced or enforced to do things that uh, compromise their values. Anyway, that's a broad context, uh, a bit of context about the film. Um, do you have any questions? So, This cohort of people, yeah. young people, you talk about the internet as, as being sort of that medium for these young people to learn about what's happening. I go on the internet and most of my friends are much more likely to share a picture of Kim Kardashian's ass than they are <laughs> something that's relevant to, to what you just presented. Yes. Are there enough of, the, of those people in this cohort to really... To affect. To, what, and what, what's, what's the result that you'd like? To affect some change? Right, exactly. Well, firstly, you don't need everybody in the world. Because the, you do also need Kim Kardashian fans to do, go and do their thing. I don't know why you need them, but you do need them in society. Uh, and you need people who post cats and all that stuff. But you only really need 5, 10, 15% of a global audience to start thinking in this way. Because the likelihood is they're going to be in positions where they can affect change. That's the likelihood. Right. So this idea that you need 100% of the people to agree on absolutely everything all the time to then all march on Westminster and go, by the way, we're going to change this, that's wrong. Um, and that's why in the film we put this, uh, this um, line that revolutions are philosophical. And when, uh, when a, an economy starts to crumble in the way ours is at the moment, or the Western economy, because it's been built on sand, those systems collapse very quickly. And they get replaced very quickly by better systems, because humans are fundamentally reasonable and good. There's a few nut jobs. 
right? And but they're a total minority, as as we said in the film. So um, I don't. So the guys who are posting that stuff, as soon as they see a, a, a cohort of people doing stuff which is a bit cooler, they're going to be posting that stuff. I can guarantee that. And here's the reason that we're not here to throw bags of gravel or stones at the old system. The old system's doing a great job of kicking itself in, 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 the, in the shins. Uh, uh, so let it do it. Right? And we're not there with placards going, what do we want change? When do we want it now? That's futile, in my view. What we're doing is creating a cooler camp. And I can tell you now, because I was at a charity event on Monday, that there are so many people coming out of corporate jobs at 35 wondering what the hell went on for the last decade because they've worked every hour God sends and they've got a bit of money for it but all of the work fundamentally is pretty meaningless. Right? And on Monday night I was listening to all these reformed corporate types or trying to be reformed corporate types who are now saying I just want to give back which is a weird concept because really what you're giving back shouldn't have been taken in the first place. right? But what they're saying is all that time that I spent in those jobs was meaningless and I've got all this money but now I want to do something with it. And what I'm saying is, don't go, this cohort would be wiser not to go and get all this money and then try and solve the problem the other, the other way out. Actually, working with a sense of meaning and purpose and actually doing a job you love means you're going to be far more successful over the long run than you will be by getting any short-term gain out of a merchant bank or investment bank. That's the mindset I'm talking about. Well, they're, all, they're finding it almost impossible now. I mean, look at Goldman. They're finding it almost impossible to hire bankers because of the social stigma. I mean, you know, it's tough for bankers now. And I know I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not talking about we should have a whip round. But, you know, the, the, you, they sat, and I've seen it happen. You know, they're at parties, and they, you go, what do you do for a living? You're a banker, and everyone goes, oh. There's a kind of leper in the corner, you know. And this so, so, people, so, so why would you want to go in and become that person? You know, and, and so Goldman are now saying, well, we'll give you more money as young bankers. And the golden handshake deals out of Ivy League universities will be better. But they're not finding it easy to recruit talent. And that's what I mean about this cohort, because the talent are going in different places. And of course, Zuckerberg has made dorm room entrepreneurship the coolest thing in the world, right? So everyone wants to go and work in tech or go and start their own startup or go and do that. It's far more fulfilling than going in and asking you know, your boss for a day's holiday because you've got a funeral and you have to ask for permission for all this stuff. I mean, that's all old mentality. It's all gone, I would suggest. It's just we're living with the remnants of it. Anything else? It's also a very loaded language and people get a little bit, you get this feeling of rejection automatically because you think, oh, okay, come on, this is an act too loaded. So that was on purpose, I guess, but what is the, what is the aim? What is, what do, 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 you know, I, I don't think that you want to create a cohort of people. The aim of the film? And yeah, like what is what's, like the intention? The intent, but uh, that's a better question. So the intent behind the film? was, um, and the reason why it's independently funded, was to restart this debate on, on terms that are as um, uh, um, neutral and universal as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not all right. That we've been made some, we're too cavalier about the gold standard, we know that. Um, but it does ask questions about, if people have never hit that subject before, you're all educated, if people haven't hit that subject before, they say, well, what is money? So to restart a debate, to obliterate the ideology that sits at the heart of neoclassical economics because it's so, and neoliberalism because it's so damaging. So to really take that on. Um, and lastly, to get people to, to re-question a lot of the stuff that they've been taught. So that they've been doing personal, like individually, because usually when you see these films you think, yes, okay, but I'm just one little tiny drop in this big ocean, I can't do anything. I'm just thinking, oh yeah, it's cool. That's true, and the next day I'm going to you know, do the same thing that I've always done, right? Yeah, oh, great. <laughs> no, I, I don't think that. <laughs> don't do that. No, no, where, I don't. Where are you from? I'm from Germany. No, where about? Berlin. 
That's an open-minded liberal city. Um, it's a very open-minded liberal city, and I don't see me in this kind of categorization, but um, I think... You're not open-minded and liberal. <laughs> no, in the categorization of next day I'm going to get up and do the same stuff again. Right. But um, I think that it's still very hard to grasp for, for I guess, the majority, because this is a sustainability bubble of service. Um, who are already kind of into this. Yeah, I mean, and, and we hear this criticism. The, the two criticisms we hear all the time is, I'm just one person, mm. what can I do? Well, Rosa Parks was just one person. And she didn't get off the bus. You say, yeah, but she just didn't get off the bus. So, well, yeah. But look at the context around why she didn't get off the bus. So she was just one person. I'm not saying don't get off the bus. Because now you get pepper spray off the bus, right? But, um, but so the, I'm just one person is a non-argument because change only ever came through just one person or to, through a, a collective, which is figure, you know, figuratively one person doing one thing, which leads to a, a bunch of other action. So, and and, she, and Camilla Batman Gallup says that you know it's perverse narcissism to say I'm too small, I can't do anything. It's too many gates of responsibility. And the second thing um, is that, yeah, it is targeted. We haven't done it down. Have you seen Fiona Bruce, the BBC newsreader? Have you seen her read the news? It's as if we're all nine. And she might as well do it with a large abacus. You know, she went, and now the weather. You know, as if we don't know what that is. I mean, so, so, I, so I, I really hate it, you know, and, and, she, and, so I, and I can't stand that. I think that if you play tennis with somebody who's better than you, you become a bit better. Right? So let's put this out there and let's put it at a level where people can go and graze on it and say, well, look, I don't understand that. So if you don't understand it, you've got a smartphone and you've got Wikipedia or, or, or an endless resource to find out about it. My aim as the filmmaker is to, um, and not just me, the whole team, because it's not just me that made it by any stretch, it's about 50 people behind it. Um, and, um, and our aim was to start that debate again, to come back to the first point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Thank you. Yeah. The, the problem is that it's a sustainable problem, right? It's a what? Sustainable problem. Systemic problem, yeah. So that's a present sustainable answer. I mean, that is what Islamic finance at the beginning started to try to do. Yeah. And um, it had a problem because when you try to become sustainable, you just finish the mimicking the conversion finance. Yeah. So, and I see the point, of course, every individual is important in doing something, but um, there is limitation for that in the world we are living in today. And you see to every question that happens, be it political or economic, for example, Australia is the same problem. It starts with a movement of people and ends up being a mix of every problem in the world because of the globalization. So, I mean, it's not a platform presidency, but there is a limitation. Yeah. Yeah. I think the sustainable thing, we all think it's outside and we've got to go and solve the world. I think the sustainable thing is, is personal. So just do something that you find sustainable. And working 18 hour days for, for a salary, where they put you on the scrap heap at 46 and say thanks for your time, that to me is a ridiculous way to live your life. Um, so personal sustainability ultimately, and one person ultimately affects more and more people. Because people go, well, she looks happy. What's she doing? You know, you go, well, I have time to see my kids, or I have time to, you know, look after myself. And that personal sustainability at an individual level does spread. I don't think we should see it as, one, as trying to change everything all at once. I think, it's, I think it is individual. I think it is small steps up for that. So, so there was a lot of talk of banks almost magically creating money yeah. uh, out of nothing. Yeah. And there was a professor on that, I can't remember who it was, who said, when I explained to my students, they're amazed and they yeah. can't believe it. Um, but I don't think it was ever explained how. And I was just wondering why you chose not to explain the fractional reserve banking. Um, because we, had, we did, and we had a big animation in the movie. Um, but there's so much online, there's so many places that you can learn about fractional reserve banking. That, we, that putting it in this with everything else was just too heavy, it, it was too much because we were inflated, we were talking about the money supply, we were talking about wages, we were talking about everything. 
uh, around this. And I, and, and I took the decision that an awful lot of people who are going to be watching this under, gener broadly understand the fractional reserve banking or the pernicious nature of it. So we, didn't, so we, so we dropped the animation out. Okay. Do you think that it should have stayed in? Yes. Just to explain to people who don't understand, who don't understand economics, the mechanism behind money creation. But you know, if you think about, if the bank gives you a credit card and you can spend fifteen hundred pounds on it, that is nothing. Like they just print a credit card out, and you get it. it. It's as simple as that. It doesn't. There is a whole complex system behind it. But it's in our daily lives. It's present. It's th there. It's you're right. I, th I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, and and here's the answer that there's only so much you, you can do with a film. Um, so, look, with the book, look, company, we go into exactly how and, and all the rest of it, but with film what you're trying to do is paint broad emotional strokes and, and rabble rouse a bit. Um, and what was happening with those animations is we kept getting stuck in academia. It, it became too academic, like showing people how to do that, uh, how that happened. Yeah. And we couldn't concertina it enough to give it a thorough enough uh, explanation. But it's a perfect book for the book. Ross, I want to ask you a question, but before I do, yeah. can you tell me, can you tell us all about a bit more about yourself, what's your background, what you study, what you've got? Yeah. Because I don't know anything. Okay, so I'm not an economist, okay. um, which is helpful, um, because if you are, you, you, yeah, you, you're in trouble. Um, basically, we went to we screened the film. I tell you this at Oxford Union and debated it there, and you can imagine what that was like, right? Um, so, and Professor David Vines came up to us afterwards. He said, "Thank you, he's head of economics at Oxford, um, and on certain other PPE course." And he said, "Thanks for making this, because now I can openly say to all my students that what we've been teaching for the last 45, 50, 60 years is basically useless." <laughs> And I was like, whoa, you know, that, that, I was going to put that on the DVD box. <laughs> and, um, and so my background is, uh, non, um, I, was, I wanted to be a farmer when I was 18. I left school and wanted to be a farmer. So I thought, where's the best place to be a farmer, like to become the best farmer in the world, right? Like uber farmer. And, um, and uh, so I went to a place called the Royal Agricultural College for three years. And, uh, and, and while I was there, I, 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 they started teaching us economic, land economics. And, 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 and he said, you know, one of the first things he said is, oh, we don't look at land as a factor of production. And I'm like, at agricultural college, and you don't look at land as a factor of production. I like, how deluded do you want to be? And he said, no, no, it's just not relevant. And then, then that, that was it. I was like, right, what, isn't, what else isn't relevant? And then I left, and, and, and then couldn't buy a farm, and I, and I wanted to buy a farm. And I was like, what's all this land problem going on? And on the call, on my course, I was with Prince William's best mate, who owns half of Suffolk. But on the same course, I was with a guy called Rhys Davis, and he owns very little bit of land, or his parents own a little bit of land in Wales. And he, uh, and he was deeply entrepreneurial, and this other bloke couldn't tie his shoelaces, frankly. And, um, and I was like, well, how come these aristocrats are thick and, and minted? And this Welsh hill farmer is entrepreneurial and skint. And, and then you start digging. Literally, you're like, uh, okay, and then you work out land ownership, and then you work out economics, and then you go, oh, all right, it's all rigged. It's all rigged. So that's basically, so then, you know, then you start, then I went to the BBC and started making some films there and, 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 and worked in theatre for ages as an assistant director, because I thought storytelling is quite interesting, um, and Shakespeare's interesting, and all that stuff. And that's actually why I think artists are far more uh, um, qualified to sort the economy out than economists. And that might sound odd, but I really think this now, that what we need now, what economics basically in this country is a failure, in the world is a failure of imagination. Okay. But having said that, yeah. one of the things you touched on in the video yeah. is terrorism yeah. and gold and silver. Yeah. It might sound controversial, yeah. but what you've probably heard this recent... Uh, you know what I'm about yeah. to say. The uh, Islamic State's decision to mint gold and silver coins. Yeah. What do you think? What are the implications of that? What, do, what are your thoughts about that? Is that imagination or? Well, the, well, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the thing is that um, when people lose confidence in fiat currency, yeah. which they will, 
that then it's then you've seen those pictures of people in the Weimar Republic with wheelbarrows full of notes, and the wheelbarrow's worth more than the notes. So, so people are going to want, and that's why we touched on gold, that people want something tangible that they know is a store of wealth for their hard-earned money, right? So it's eminently sensible to, to use uh, it as a tandem currency. Now, you can't use the gold standard because you need a flexible uh, money supply so you can uh, extend it and contract it for trade and population growth, right? And then who owns the gold and all that um, argument. But, but their decision to do it is, is sensible. It's a great store of wealth. Everyone should own a little bit of, uh, of, of silver and gold. Um, and, uh, um, and when people do lose their faith in the fiat money system, they'll run back to precious metals very quickly, in my view. The problem with gold standard is everyone thinks it's a libertarian, Austrian, loony, tune, tin hat brigade uh, solution. <laughs> and sadly, a lot of the spokespeople for that movement are uh, <laughs> a bit loony. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so the, the messages get terribly mixed. But, in, but broadly, you know, a, a money supply backed up by a basket of commodities would be far more uh, reliable and stable than some money supply where you can just print money and bail banks out and reflate asset prices. I mean, look at the mess now. Look at the catastrophic mess of the housing market. If you don't got a house, you know, good luck trying to buy one. Because there's just all paper money inflating those land values. Thank you. So. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's really interesting what you've been, you know, what you've tried to put in the single film, a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, I'm really interested in knowing how did you arrive at four horsemen and not. Um, Five horsemen. Not <laughs> um, because four horsemen in the Book of Revelation. And, and did you did you debate on that? In, not really. Someone was, I didn't come up with it. Someone suggested it. I thought it was a great name. Uh, it's a great title. But, um, it's in the book of Revelation. Everyone knows it uh, as that. And, and then we just adapted the story from there. Because you need to be dramatic in film, obviously, to capture uh, imagination. So that's, that was the plan. But, one bloke, but it hit the American Bible belt. And um, because we don't mention Jesus uh, and, and, and uh, the book of Revelation generally, um, he, this bloke wrote to me and he said that um, the reason why Somerset flood, w flooded was because we'd made this film and not made <laughs> <really. laughs> uh, It's quite a leap uh, of uh, imagination. So the, so, the, so the Christian movement in America aren't happy because there's too, too little Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Yeah, um, the just okay. So. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, they're talking about introducing a New York, New York on... Um, Non-violent extremism, and the way they're currently defining it, yeah. it includes anything to threaten the economy. So, what you're currently doing is actually, will, if they pass that law, could be prosecuted. Can they kind of show they how desperate they are? Doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But can they prosecute refs retrospectively? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Why not <laughs> carry on? You yeah. Carry on as you do it. Would yeah. you carry on? Would I? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you would because. I mean, that's a ridiculous law. Um, so would you carry on doing, yeah, you, you just keep making, you keep making things. But they're running out of options. Think of it. They're really, you know, unless you're saying well, we want a totalitarian state where you just, you're running out of options. Sorry, there was a lady. Yeah, I was just going to just, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's called John Perkins. He's written a book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. What he used to do is go around the world and um, go and speak to leaders uh, and chancellors and say, look, uh, we'll do a debt deal with you. And they'd arrange a predatory debt deal where they knew the nation wouldn't be able to repay the debt. And then uh, they'd go back, allow them to default, go back to them and say, well, listen, I know. It's like subprime mortgages, basically, uh, but for countries. Uh, and uh, you say, look, you defaulted, so uh, have you got any resources? And they go, yeah, you know, we've got a few diamonds. Okay, cool. You give us all the diamonds, and then we forget about this nasty little debt. And it's a way of getting resources cheaply out of countries, way below market prices, uh, and using debt and, and lawyers to do so. What do you work for? 
Who do I work for? No, who did uh, it, uh, who did he, who, he, he worked for a subsidiary of um, the intelligence services set it up, but it's a subsidiary of, it, it, it's like, uh, you know, something Inc. And it's a, and that company is a subsidiary of Halliburton, the CIA, and to, like the, the bad guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they now want to give back. Yeah. Um, I saw Gustavo um, Gilles talk at the yeah. uh, World Festival a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about the, um, yeah, like the, the myth of Western liberty, the failing of capitalism, um, and he, everyone was sort of dying for some kind of uh, like conclusion. Like Jay, Zizek. can you speak up, please? Yeah, so uh, I saw Gustavo uh, Zizek talk at the World Festival and, and talked about the myth of Western liberty, the failings of capitalism, and everyone really wanted to know um, what he proposed as a solution, like how does the individual uh, on their daily grind go about making some kind of uh, impact in, in, uh, towards change? And um, in the same way that you talk about, uh, in the same way you talk about, um, you know, these people are running out of uh, options, like you know, they're crazy, passing these crazy laws to try and yeah. suppress people's freedom and yeah. speaking up against them. Um, and I know you hinted it here, but at the end you say, like, you know, op open your mind, read, um, like, be an individual, like, but what, how, does, how does that translate I mean, for the people who, you know, aren't in the institutions that we are, for someone who is working in, like, a, you know, in a, in a wage job where they can barely get by, they have to work crazy hours, um, what sort of thing do you think when you, when you think of solution to people like that? Um, how do you see people in those situations in, um, sort of dealing with their daily problems? This might sound really um, brutal, and, and I don't mean it this way, but their daily grind, um, and they're stretched every which way, and I realise that, but ultimately um, there is still the option that they can go and... Uh, that, that maybe not at the moment, but... As the economy continues to falter, new businesses will pop up where jobs, or dignified jobs in, in democratic organisations will arise. Now that might not be the case at the moment, and especially not in the US where people work, work five jobs and all that stuff. So, so the question, if I can just turn the question and say, if you were going to start an organisation now and you really looked after your staff, and you didn't do what John Lewis do, which is a partnership, but they don't pay their weight, their cleaners very much. If you genuinely uh, had no disconnect between who you said you were and who you actually are, your staff retention would be phenomenal. Um, and your profits would go up because of it, and you'd start a virtuous circle. And that sort of business would then have ramifications across its industry, and other businesses would start to mimic it. And if you want an example, people like Patagonia, the, the um, business, in, the, the outdoor clothing business in the US, have done this. Right? So, so maybe those people are trapped in those jobs at the moment. The more entrepreneurial of them can find the right places to go and work where it's, a, where it's better. You can't solve it all overnight. But what you can say is to people who, you can offer people a very optimistic solution. So you go and, and, and start that business or that cooperative specifically and you're going to have a model that everyone's going to mimic and it's going to make you a very, an awful lot of money, whether you're in it for that reason or not. Because you look after the worker, you look after the workplace, you look after the process, profit comes. And what's happened in the system that's capsized, we've looked, thought about profit persistently and that, that labour is expendable. Because, and and, and look, at this, look at the place, look at the mass. So it's tough to say to those people, to, you know, a cleaner who's working five jobs and all the rest of it, say, look, you know, watch this and, and sort it out. It, it, there has to be a level of uh, education, of course, and then you hope that those people go out and do the right things when they're in the marketplace. I just have, uh, I really like uh, the point that you that there is a risk also that basically while there is a transitional period or whatever you call it, um, people within the system full basically 
um, the citizens by pretending that they have changed, and that's when they usually think that they are the populist leader. Yeah. Um, and uh, we are seeing um, 